Welcome back to another edition of History in Your Own Backyard. I'm your host, Susie Selleck, and I'm joined today by David Simmons, president of the Ohio Historic Bridge Association. David, thank you for joining me here today. Glad to be here. So we are at the Muskingum County History Museum, and we are here to talk about the Dresden Suspension Bridge. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. How does the Dresden Bridge fit into Ohio history? Well, the Dresden Bridge was the first major suspension bridge in Ohio, mm -hmm. built in 1852, and then it was replaced in 1914 after a flood. So a suspension bridge has been in Dresden for 170 years. It's really quite remarkable. David, I know that you know all there is to know about bridges. So what is it about the suspension bridge that's a little bit different? Are there components that are different from other bridges? Yeah, yeah. suspension bridges are basically not like any other bridge. They have three basic elements. There's a cable that supports a level roadway. And then there are towers that the cables uh, cross over, tall towers that elevate the cables uh, to get them above the water. And then there are anchorages that the cables are anchored into. And then there's generally a fourth element. I said there was three, but there's actually a fourth, which has to do with the roadway itself. If you just suspended it by itself, it would be really flexible and bounce around and wouldn't be fun to cross in traffic. Right. So they have a stiffening truss that keeps the deck stiff as traffic crosses it. In a suspension bridge, there is, like most bridges, compression and tension. The tension components are the cable itself, it's being pulled apart, and the compression, major compression element are the towers that's being pushed down by the weight of the cables in the roadway. And then that stiffening truss that I mentioned has both compression and tension because it's a basic truss, so it, has, it operates with both. David, why was the suspension bridge chosen for Dresden in 1852, though? Yeah, it's an excellent question, because after the construction of the Wheeling Suspension Bridge over the Ohio River in 1849, um, there was a, a real enthusiasm in the Ohio Valley for suspension bridges. In fact, that enthusiasm can be documented. The builder was a man named Charles Ellett Jr., who was from Philadelphia and was for a time um, along with John Roebling, John A. Roebling. These two guys were the leading suspension bridge designers in the country, and because they were so good, Roebling did the Brooklyn Bridge, 1883, and the Covington-Cincinnati Suspension Bridge in 1869. Um, these two guys were really international leaders in suspension bridge design, and they made America leaders in suspension bridge design. Ellett's Wheeling Bridge uh, was a thousand feet, so it was the longest bridge built in America at the time, mm -hmm. and created this big enthusiasm for suspension bridges. David, so are you saying that the first suspension bridge was built to be trendy? Is Actually it was. I mean. It, you can document the fact that suspension bridges were being built throughout Ohio after 1849 in places where you wouldn't necessarily have to have a suspension bridge. It's just because it was a trendy design at the time. But in reality, there were other reasons for Dresden thinking about a suspension bridge. There was a side canal that went from the Ohio and Erie Canal uh, from the main canal through Dresden to the Muskingum River. Mm -hmm. And right in the early 1850s, the state was actually involved in a major controversy with railroads. They had just completed this canal system. It was making money for them. And then all of a sudden these railroads are being built and they wanted to cross canals with their tracks. And the state said, no way, you're not building any, any bridges over our canals. And they actually introduced legislation to say that it was illegal to do that, but cooler heads prevailed, and it actually um, was allowed, but with very special, you know, you had to send plans and specs and so exactly how you were crossing the canals. But in a way, having a suspension bridge was going to be higher than just a regular uh, level uh, bridge over the river, so it was in a way kind of 
above the fray. David, who is responsible for building the Dresden Bridge? A company was formed in 1848 to build the bridge, um, but apparently the guys that invested in it were a little suspicious of this new suspension bridge technology. Mm -hmm. um, and it was only built because George W. Adams said, all right, I'll pay the entire bill. He paid $29,000 to build the bridge himself. And his nephew, George Copeland, yeah. was the man who was actually given credit for being the physical builder of the bridge. And he followed Charles Ellett's, I mean, not only was he copying the fact that it was a suspension bridge, but he followed Ellett's design. Ellett had done a lot of his training in France and they used separate cables uh, rather than wrapping the cables up like Roebling did, right? they used separate cables. And in the Dresden design, they used four separate cables for, for the bridge, uh, for the design of the cables. What happened to Ohio's first suspension bridge? Yeah, this 450-foot bridge, built in 1852, stood for 60 years. Uh, it was originally a toll bridge. The investors needed to get revenue back from mm -hmm. the bridge. Um, until after the Civil War, and then the residents of Dresden petitioned the county commissioners who bought the bridge and it became a free bridge after that. Um, there was a sign posted on the bridge that no one could cross the bridge faster than a walk okay. and that no more than 20 head of livestock could be on the bridge at any one time. So I could only bring like 20 cows over uh, and then the next at, 20? At, at maximum, all, right. Oh, oh, and that's At max. one time, that's right. So right. safe side, 18. Right. Okay. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> In 1901, there was a, a major uh, snowstorm that covered the deck and the, the deck was, was uh, sagging. So a bunch of guys had to go out and, and push the snow off just to save the bridge. But the thing that actually resulted in the destruction of the bridge was the 1913 flood. This was a major flood all across Ohio. Yeah. Uh, 10 inches of rain in a matter of hours. The ground was frozen and it just filled all the valleys, washed out all kinds of bridges. Some debris got caught in the stiffening truss mm -hmm. of the, of the uh, Dresden wire bridge, and it pulled the towers down. So that was the, the end of that. Gotcha. So did they rebuild it? They like did. right away? They did. In fact, as that was in March. In June already, the county commissioners were advertising for a new bridge. So they were moving fairly quickly on it. Um, they advertised for multiple different multiple kinds of structures. They advertised for a steel truss, a concrete arch, or a wire suspension bridge. And they actually decided on the steel truss, but then for some reason in 1914 decided to rebid it, and then they contracted with the Bell Fountain Bridge Company. Because the original bridge had been destroyed by a flood, they put really tall towers on the new bridge so that it would be elevated above any potential floods. But the cable design itself was rather novel. It was basically following a design that had been developed long ago, maybe like a, a hundred years earlier, in yeah. Britain by British. At that time, the British were the leaders in uh, the international leaders in s suspension bridge design. Time. And they used I-bar cables. Instead of wire cables, they used I-bar cables. So cables consisting of eye bars with pins and the entire cable was made out of that and that's what they did at Dresden. So in a way it was um, looking back into the archives of bridge design. Right. But it was also a perfect design for, for the contractor, Bell Fountain Bridge Company, because they made eye bar suspension bridge or eye bar bridges um, all across Ohio. And so using that technology made a lot of sense if they were going to build a suspension bridge too. David, you said that the I-bar cable was British. So how does this transfer into an American design? Yeah, American engineers were known for their pin-connected bridges. And every pin-connected bridge had to have I-bars. So the Bell Fountain Bridge Company, which had been building these bridges all across the state, was really the ideal company to build a suspension bridge using I-bars. Did the Bell Fountain Bridge Company then design the bridge? No, it was a man named Clyde T. Morris, who was a professor at Ohio State. 
Uh, he had worked with the Youngstown Bridge Company in the 1890s when the other I-bar suspension bridge in Ohio, it's a very small bridge in Mill Creek Park, it was built in 1895, and he started working for Youngstown shortly after that. So he might have become familiar with it, but he also worked with the King Bridge Company and the new Columbus Bridge Company, all of which built these I-bar pin-connected bridges. So Morris was very familiar with I-bar design, well-versed in I-bars, and that could have been uh, a, a major factor in why he chose that design for the cables in Dresden. Is he alone on this bridge design? Did he take part in other bridges? He did build other bridges, and that's a very interesting question because um, he's also known for, for designing the engineering in a horseshoe-shaped structure in Columbus known as <laughs> Ohio Stadium. You don't say. In 1922. <laughs> but the other bridge that he was most, maybe infamous is the right word, was the Point Pleasant Bridge, also known as the Silver Bridge, that he was the consulting engineer for in 1927. And it was an I-bar suspension bridge, but it's most known for its collapse in December 15, 1967, during rush hour traffic, during Christmas shopping. Um, it collapsed over the Ohio River. 31 vehicles went down with it, 64 people ended up in the water, 46 of them died. So this was like the most famous bridge disaster in Ohio history. And the, the cause turned out to be a fracture in one of those eye bars mm. that hadn't been noticed. Um, and there were no, um, it's a term called redundancy. Okay. In other words, there was no, there were no parallel members. So when one eye bar went, the whole bridge went. Wow. Um, but this collapse became probably the most influential in the entire country. Aside from this just being an absolute tragedy, loss of life and all that, what's why was this so? In, why was this collapse so influential? Well, you can imagine that there was a lot of interest in why it collapsed. In fact, one of the first major bridge uh, disaster investigations in the 20th century resulted from it. They actually fished all the pieces of the bridge out of the river and reassembled it on the banks to figure out exactly what had happened. And there were all kinds of reports um, as a result of that study. But the major consequence of the collapse was that it, there was legislation passed the very next year that required that all bridges in the state and across the country, not just Ohio, but all across the country, would be inspected every year. Um, and these were federally funded inspections. So they were actually providing not just the regs to say you have to do this, they were providing the money to mm -hmm. do it. Um, and of course now, um, the issue is, even though bridges are being inspe inspected, there's no money to actually repair them. But the, the st starting point for bridge inspections all across the country was this collapse and the legislation that was passed the next year, something that uh, obviously uh, a historic bridge uh, group, we support these inspections. I mean, this is important. Obviously, yeah. So where is the Dresden Suspension Bridge? What's the status on that now? What's the status? Yeah, what's the status? It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1978. That's the nation's official list of what's significant for uh, local, state, and national significance. Um, ODOT decided they wanted to bypass the bridge, but you know the bridge is really significant because of the relationship to Ohio Bridge Building, the Bell Fountain Bridge Company, and all the basic components of the bridge are essentially that of a metal truss that was built. I mean, you've saw, seen these metal trusses all across the state. Here's a Dresden example. It's actually a suspension bridge, but it's very much has all the components of a basic metal truss bridge. ODOT decided they wanted to bypass the bridge, um, perhaps out of concern for the, the silver bridge collapse, um, but they agreed to leave it in place, paint it, uh, and and uh, it, that's where it still stands today. 
The Dresden Suspension Bridge must be important to the Ohio Historic Bridge Association, so please tell. It is, in fact. Um, the group was founded in 1960 to save a covered bridge, but by the 1990s, we came to realize that there were all kinds of historic bridges in the state that should be preserved, stone bridges, concrete bridges, suspension bridges, uh, and certainly metal truss bridges. Um, and so we have tours in the, the warm months and lectures in the cold months uh, in Columbus. And then we have a newsletter that we circulate uh, four times a year. So we're trying to be an advoca advocacy, statewide advocacy for all kinds of historic structures in the state. Um, and the Dresden Bridge is really almost like uh, a monument to the importance of bridge inspection. Mm -hmm. So it's really kind of one of the types of structures that we really feel are important to be preserved in the state. Thank you for watching another episode of History in Your Own Backyard coming to you today from the Muskingum County History Museum. Joining me, David Simmons, president of the Ohio Historic Bridge Association. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And remember, travel, travel slowly, slowly and, and stop, stop often. often. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.